In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Sega was one of the top competitors to Nintendo and other smaller companies. The Sega Genesis was a heavy hitter in the 16-bit era, effectively drawing a line between Nintendo kids and Sega kids. Once the dust had settled, Sega needed something to push into the next generation. They then released the Sega Saturn, an overpriced, underpowered commercial failure which threatened their position in the console race. Once the PlayStation 1 was released, Sega began working on their next console to try and stay competitive, and on September 9th, 1999, the Sega Dreamcast was released. Mmm, that's nice. Just look at this beauty. Look at it! Powered by Windows CE, it's more compact and a bit sleeker than its predecessor, and it came in white, which was a first for a North American Sega console. The machine launched in the US for $199 US. It featured a 32 bit processor, a 200 megahertz, 16 megabytes of RAM, 8 megabytes of video RAM, and 2 megabytes of audio RAM. The graphics chip was a 100 MHz Power VR2 chip, and the sound chip was a Yamaha 64 channel at 67 MHz. The main board had the CPU located right here, two 64 megabit RAM modules for a total of 16 megabytes of RAM, the Power VR2 graphics chip with 8 megabytes of video RAM, the Yamaha sound chip, the 2 megabytes of audio RAM. And finally, the boot ROM. The controllers were surprisingly comfortable to use. It featured an analog stick, a D-pad, and seven buttons to use. It had two slots for memory cards, and this would be the last time that controllers were used as a main connection point for memory cards. The VMU, or Visual Memory Unit, was not your standard memory card. The VMU features a small LCD screen and audio output from a small tiny speaker. It was powered by two 3-volt button cell batteries. It had a D-pad and four buttons to access the memory unit's internal functions and to play minigames. The VMU can show game information, be used as a small handheld gaming device, and be able to connect to certain Sega arcade machines of the time. Out of 128 kilobytes of space, you're only able to save to 100 kilobytes total. You're able to review game data and delete files if you wanted to make some extra space. So depending on what was saved to the unit, you could play mini games that correspond to that game. For example, in Sonic Adventure, you could play a little chow game that was based off of what it was saved on the card. You would plug your VMU in the first controller slot, and you can see the VMU screen. And you plug a second VMU in the back slot, and it gives you two locations to save game data. Once your game is loaded, the game's title will show up on the VMU screen in the controller. Now, I thought this was a pretty neat feature when I first saw it. I mean, a controller memory card that showed game data, even if it was out of the controller and not playing in the game. What a neat idea that was. And if you look down while you were playing, you could see cartoon characters from the game you were playing displayed in the VMU screen. In 1995, the development team was considering a new graphics chip for a 64-bit Saturn II, or an add-on peripheral. Considering the Saturn's poor performance, it was decided just to create a new console. The previously mentioned Hitachi SH4 chip and the Power VR2 graphics processor were chosen for the new Dreamcast. Sega produced the console with a PC in mind rather than a video game console. With Windows CE, it made porting from PC to the console easier. Because the Saturn had tarnished its reputation, Sega plans to remove its name from the console and establish a new gaming brand similar to Sony's PlayStation, but they decided to retain the name. Before launch, EA had announced that they were not going to develop sports games for the Dreamcast because they wanted exclusive rights. Sega Sports helped fill that void. After a change in management, the launch was successful, but that soon changed as a glitch marred the launch by defective GD-ROM disc. And here are 10 Dreamcast facts. Number 1. The Sega Dreamcast was the first 128-bit console in the market. Number 2. The name of this console was declared as Katana, but was later changed to Dreamcast. 
Number 3 Just one year after its release, the Dreamcast had successfully outsold Nintendo. Number 4 At the time of its release, it was the only game console that had a hit game in every genre. Number 5 It is said that the Xbox console was inspired by the Sega Dreamcast. Number 6 The logo of the Dreamcast console means Origin of Power. Number 7 As of 2002, 10.6 million units were sold worldwide. Number 8 Even though the Dreamcast was short-lived, the makers produced a few different versions of the console, the most popular being a black model with the Sega Sports logo on the lid. Number 9 as of November 2007, the console had 688 official titles. Some of the titles are being still released for hardcore fans. And finally, number 10. The newest game released for the Dreamcast was Ghostblade on September 21st, 2015. That is news to me. After shortages in chip production, declining sales, and the release of the extremely popular PlayStation 2, the Sega Dreamcast was discontinued in March 2001. The console survived for 19 months before the plug was pulled. Sega slashed the price of the console as to sell up remaining inventory and the final store price was $49.99. What a deal. The excitement for the PS2, lack of support from EA and Squaresoft, and the constant disagreements of Sega executives were the primary factors in the Dreamcast's failure. However, during its time in the sun, it was a neat console. The game library is still celebrated and features some memorable titles and super hits. And there you have it, Sega's final entry in the console race. Even though the Xbox and PlayStation reign supreme to this day, the Dreamcast has a special spot on my gaming shelf. I bought mine from Walmart on layaway, and when I finally brought it home, I was absolutely amazed. The graphics, the games, the speed. The second stage in Sonic Adventure made me a little queasy from the mind-numbing speed, but then I put a different game in just to settle down. If you were a Sega fan, then I'm sure this left a mark in your childhood. It sure has on mine. Some people say that it's Sega's best console ever, but that is a discussion for another time. If you like this sort of content, then hit the like button and consider subscribing. I've got lots of old retro consoles on my shelf that I would love to talk about. Well, anyway, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.